There's a reason why I have to deliver this talk remotely. There's a reason why I haven't been able to address a real audience in person for almost a year. There's a reason why I currently can't visit a hairdresser and sort out this mess. What there seems to be no reason for, however, is the fact that one of the most effective ways in which we can drastically reduce the chances of another debilitating pandemic from occurring again is seemingly being ignored or at least isn't present in the public consciousness. We're still not entirely sure about the origins of COVID-19. It's generally thought to have migrated to us from a bat in China, but this virus is only one example of a type of disease called a zoonotic disease. A zoonotic disease is one which originates in non-human animals, but develops the ability to transmit from those other species to human beings. Now, if we ever need a reminder of our place in nature, not as the untouchable lords of the animal kingdom, as many humans see themselves, but as animals ourselves, who are just as susceptible to the trials and tragedies of the natural order as any other species on planet Earth, we can find it in the humbling force with which a zoonotic disease can, in the blink of an eye, come to devastate us so surprisingly and so severely that it threatens our very existence. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, there have been seemingly endless efforts to prevent something like it from ever happening again. But something is being overlooked. Like a discussion about lung cancer that omits mention of smoking, or a discussion about pollution that ignores the transportation industry, the conversation surrounding pandemic prevention currently has a dangerous and gaping blind spot that I cannot believe isn't getting more attention. COVID-19, thankfully, looks like it soon will become a thing of the past, but we still face a very real risk of more pandemics happening again in the future. Here's what I'm here to convince you of. If we genuinely want to reduce our risk of zoonotic diseases developing and potentially causing more pandemics, we simply cannot continue to ignore the elephant in the room. Or, more accurately, the pig, or the cow, or the chicken on the factory farm. The vast majority of animal products that we consume, that's meat but also dairy and eggs, comes from factory farms. Now, many people know of the ethical horrors of animals being confined and harmed within these disgusting facilities, but not so many people know that an unintended consequence of housing the animals we unnecessarily farm for food in such close proximity, such high numbers and such outrageously unhygienic conditions as are present in factory farms, is an explosion in the likelihood that an animal-based virus will mutate into one with zoonotic abilities. That is, one that spreads to humans. Factory farms are our principal source of animal-based foods, but they're also breeding grounds for these kinds of viruses and pose a severe threat to public health and human well-being that simply cannot continue to be overlooked. To understand why, we have to first unpack what exactly is a factory farm. Factory farms are profit-driven, large-scale, industrialized engines of animal cruelty. Their primary motive in farming animals is not the ethical treatment of these inmates, is not environmental sustainability, and is certainly not a provision of acceptable hygiene standards. Factory farms exist solely to make as much money as possible from the exploitation of animals, and unfortunately, ethical, environmental, and public health considerations only serve as a roadblock in the way of increasing profit margins, and so are completely neglected by these farms. Factory farms are a relatively new experiment in animal agriculture, only really arising in the 20th century when the discovery of vitamins and the development of antibiotics allowed animals to be kept indoors, in close proximity, and in far greater numbers than previously possible. Now, this leads to the familiar and horrifying images of chickens crammed into barns, pigs and cows in cages so small that they can't turn around, and the slaughter of these animals to the tune of around 210 million per day. Not including fish, by the way, who were slaughtered in the billions per day. Around 7.5 billion human beings are currently alive on planet Earth. We kill that many land animals alone every 36 days. And that's just for food, right? not including animals killed for other purposes, like clothing, and not even including sea life at all. 
Animal suffering doesn't just permeate our food and our clothing, by the way. Animal suffering is everywhere. We know that it's in our food and in our clothing, but it's also in our furniture, our sports, our medicine and our cosmetics. It's in British currency, alcohol, backpacks, violins, guitar straps, bibles, tires, blankets, phone cases, wallets, and even fireworks. You might be currently listening to this talk while sat on the skin of a dead cow. The only place that I can think of where animal suffering is truly nowhere to be found is in the moral consideration of the average human being. It's worth thinking about this the next time you hear someone accusing vegans of being the pushy or forceful ones. I promise you that I have to encounter animal products far more than you have to encounter a vegan complaining about them. Now, in case you don't already share my ethical intuition that factory farms are in urgent need of abolition, allow me to describe some of their common operations, starting with cows. Cows only produce milk for their offspring, just like human beings do. And so it's standard practice in the dairy industry to forcibly impregnate cows so they'll start producing milk. But when their calves are born as a result of this, those calves will want to drink their mother's milk. And so it's also standard practice to forcibly separate the calf from their mother so that the milk can be redirected for human consumption. Now I'm sure I don't need to explain to you the psychological stress involved in being forcibly separated from your children. But at least these mother cows don't know what will happen to their stolen calves. In the United Kingdom, 70,000 of these calves are killed in their early life each year to produce veal for human beings to eat. That mother cow will, by the way, continue to go through this cycle of exploitation until she can no longer produce milk, at which point the thanks we give her for her services is to sell her to a slaughterhouse where she'll be bolted in the head or sliced in the throat so that we can enjoy a Big Mac. Now let's talk about chickens. The chickens bred on the farms that produce our food are separated into two distinct breeds, broiler chickens who produce chicken meat and layer chickens who lay eggs. Now these are separate operations. It's not the same chickens who produce the meat and the eggs that we eat. They come from these two different breeds. Now because of this, it's a common misconception that the egg industry isn't responsible for chicken deaths. But this is unfortunately untrue. Think about those layer chickens. Of course, male chickens don't lay eggs and are therefore useless as layers. And because of this, the egg industry kills around seven billion of these male chicks every single year. Seven billion. That's like wiping out nearly every human being currently alive on planet Earth every single year for the sake of an omelet. And these chicks are killed either by suffocating them in large bags grinding them up alive in an industrial macerator, or they are, in the words of the British Egg Information Service, humanely gassed. They're also killed as soon as they're born, so both their first and last experience of this world is terror and suffering, caused only by the fact that we like to eat their products. And this chick culling occurs in all industrialized egg production, including, I'm afraid to report, free-range and organic farms. As for pigs, these poor, trusting creatures often begin their lives by having their tails cut off and their teeth pulled out without anaesthetic to prevent them from cannibalizing each other later in life when these intelligent creatures are driven to insanity by the unthinkable conditions we trap them in for most of their lives. If these piglets are considered to be unusable or unprofitable, then they're often killed immediately using so-called blunt force trauma, whereby a farmer takes the piglet by their back legs and smashes their head into the ground, killing the piglet by the force of the floor against its skull. And this is a method which the Canadian Pork Council describes as humane pig euthanasia. But maybe these pigs who die early are the lucky ones. In the UK, the most common method for slaughtering pigs who make it to adulthood for food is by forcing them into a gas chamber. The last moments of these animals' tragic lives are spent writhing around in confused agony, trapped in a cage that's been lowered into a chamber of carbon dioxide, wherein, after a lifetime of suffering, they're finally choked to death. And for what? All for the sake of a bacon sandwich. Clearly, with regards to our treatment of non-human animals, we are in need of an ethical revolution. 
a revival of the animal-loving spirit that we're all born with. You don't need to teach a child to love animals. You need to teach them to stop. And we teach our children from their earliest years to view farm animals as commodities with which we can do as we please, instead of sentient beings with whom we share the world. The love of animals is not something that's learned, it's something that's lost. When was the last time you needed to teach someone to think that dogs shouldn't be tortured and killed for food? Rediscovering our love and respect for animals is not a process of learning anything new, but unlearning the moral status that we've unjustifiably placed upon these animals just to make our food production more convenient. By refusing to fund factory farming, by drinking oat or soy milk instead of cow's milk, by cooking a chickpea curry instead of a beef one, by starting your day with oats instead of bacon, you can be a part of this ethical revival, helping animals to no longer go through this immeasurable suffering and helping yourself to no longer be a part of its cause. Simply choosing something else on the menu is all we need to do to bring this horror show to an end. It's such an insignificant thing for us to do, but it means absolutely everything to the animal that you save from being forced into that gas chamber. But I started this talk by asserting that this kind of ethical revolution doesn't just solve this massive moral problem, but also helps to solve our pandemic problem. It's clear that factory farms are ethical abominations, but what has any of this, this talk of factory farming, got to do with public health, with pandemics? Well, to be clear, the pandemic that we're currently facing was not caused by factory farming. But the next one might well be, and that's the danger. When we understand how zoonotic viruses like COVID-19 work, it becomes easy to see that factory farms play a huge role in increasing the risk that more of these viruses will materialize in the future. Viruses like the coronavirus are parasites, and they're nearly alive. They have their own DNA or RNA, but are generally not considered to be fully fledged living things since they can't survive without a host. Now, a host is simply an organism which viruses can infect and use to replicate themselves and increase their population. So in order to replicate in this manner, viruses have to infect the cells of other living beings who serve as the virus's host. Now this host carrying a virus may be a mosquito, or it may be a pig, it may be a cow, or it may be a human being. A virus will jump from one host to another any time it gets the chance to, and the more hosts that there are available, the more transmissions can occur. But as a virus replicates, it sometimes mutates. When the virus copies itself, the copy is an imperfect one, with some kind of small difference. Now, these mutations are completely random, but sometimes a mutation happens to occur that gives the virus a new ability that aids its survival, such as, for example, the ability to transmit not just from one animal to another, but from one species of animal to another. Remember, when this kind of transmission occurs, specifically from a non-human animal to a human being, we have a zoonotic disease. COVID-19 is an example of a zoonotic disease, as is bird flu, Ebola, malaria, and swine flu, some of the most famous and dangerous viruses that we know of. Now, picture again the factory farm. The barns full of animals packed together in their tens of billions per year. If these animals are carrying a virus, this translates into tens of billions of potential hosts every year. The more hosts, the more random mutations. And the more mutations, the higher the chance of the virus developing into a zoonotic disease with the ability to transmit to humans. So by keeping so many animals in the excruciatingly close conditions of factory farms, the chances of such a zoonotic disease developing explodes. If you were trying to create the most dangerous conditions possible for viral replication within animals, if you were trying to bring about a new zoonotic pandemic, you couldn't wish for something more suitable than a modern factory farm. As Josh Bolk of the United States Humane Society has said, whilst our governments are telling us to keep our distance and avoid large crowds to prevent viral transmission, we're simultaneously cramming tens of thousands of animals wall to wall inside giant factories and failing to recognize the risks, or at least choosing to ignore them. So where does this all leave us? 
Well, I'm hoping that it should be clear by now that factory farming simply needs to come to an end. Not only will this allow us to bring about a blossoming of our ethical concern for those we share this planet with, but it will also help us to fight against the risk of a repetition of the horrors that we've had a taste of with COVID-19. Every single time just one animal dies inside these ignoble factories, it makes a mockery of the claim that we're a society of animal lovers. And when we scale this abuse up to the level that we see in factory farms and continue to pay for their operations to continue, it rebuts any claim, any claim, that we're doing everything we can to combat the risk of future pandemics. And the solution to this problem is so incredibly simple that future generations will look back with astonishment that it took us so long to work it out. All we need to do to bring about an end to this nightmarish industry is eat something else. Choose something else on the menu. If we can all manage this simple task, we can collectively move towards a world much safer, much healthier, and much more ethically consistent than the world of today. Even if it were just for the sake of the animals who are currently suffering and dying as I speak these words, that would be more than a good enough reason alone to stop eating animal products. But as it turns out, it's not just in their best interest for us to stop doing so. It's in our best interest too. Thanks for listening.